The sort of people who ring me up and say they know where my children go to school, and they certainly know what my home number is and where I live, and what they're going to do to them and to my wife and to me, and who I have to take seriously because they have done it to people I know, uh, are just the people who are going to seek the protection of the hate speech law if I say what I think about their religion, which I'm now going to do. Barbara Haggerty did a, uh, a book on this called Fingerprints of God, where she interviewed a lot of the people who, who did these studies that were published in peer-reviewed journals, and a lot of the people she interviewed said that they cannot help but think, after investigating these in a scientific way, that they point to something beyond this life. I would say almost that was wrong by definition, because it's a near-death experience. It means you didn't die. <laughs> But it's the best we have. Um, no. If someone, if someone is reported dead on Tuesday and you see them on Friday, <laughs> the overwhelming, well, not the, the obvious conclusion is that the initial report was mistaken. <laughs> we have no reason to think otherwise. I've read a lot about this stuff. I, in fact, I have two, if you care to get the portable atheist which I edited, there are two accounts by great philosophers, the late um, A.J. Ayer, and fortunately very current Daniel Dennett, about their own so-called near-death experiences, hospital experiences of people who were battling with very grave onslaughts on their health, which I recommend you read for the very confirming uh, rationality that they bring to it. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza, who's a frequent um, debating partner of mine, has written a, a book about this too, and he, the most persuasive example from any hospital he's found, and I get it all the time, is a woman who floated out of her body out of the bed, made a tour of the outside of the hospital, saw the shoe. noticed that there was a running shoe <laughs> on one of the window sills, woke up, reported it to a nurse whose name we've never been told, and who went and looked, and there was the shoe. Now, if that doesn't prove it, I don't know what does. <laughs> I could hardly be re more reassured if I'd been told that it that was able to reunite it with its missing pair. <laughs> <laughs> NDE is bullshit. It doesn't count. It's not coming back from the dead, nor is it an account of what happens to you while you're, when you're gone. It's what can happen okay. to you with the help of life-preserving scientific medicine while you are still alive. Uh, uh, if uh, you get beyond deism. I don't think he even intended much to get beyond deism. Um, if there was a word a-deist, it would describe me probably rather better than the word, the vulgar word, atheist uh, does. Um, I don't have a special word for saying why I don't believe in Santa Claus, for example, or why I don't believe in the tooth fairy, or why I don't believe in astrology. I don't need a special word for that. I assume, with, with me, you assume that these are fairy tales, man-made fables, either for the frightening or the amusement of, depending on need, children. Uh, I don't believe there is a supernatural dimension, um, and I don't believe there have ever been any miracles, so I don't believe that prayers are answered, I don't believe any of this. None of this comes up so far in this argument. I'm not arguing with a religious person yet at all. I'm arguing with someone who claims to know more than I do about physics and biology. It's possible that he does. Many, many people do. But bear in mind that we cannot say that we know that there was not a prime mover. It can't, it, it's not within our compass, pitifully ignorant as we are, only scrabbling on the lower slopes of the study of physics, as all of us are, even the best. We may not say that we know there was no prime mover. We may not say that. Um, we can say that all the laws appear to operate without that assumption. Uh, it's very, very, very rare indeed to meet a physicist of any standing from Einstein onwards, who is not at the most a Spinozist. In other words, someone who might say there could be a pantheism somewhere, there could be a force, uh, but there is no, no way you can take a step from the laws of physics, the observable creation of the cosmos, uh, that leads you to the belief that there is an intervening personal God who does answer prayers, who does watch over you, who does notice what you're up to, who does mind, what you do, who you sleep with, and in what position, uh, what you eat, 
what you eat and on what days of the week, uh, what propitiations and sacrifices you will make, what commandments you will observe. There is no possible way, no one's even tried it, of getting from the laws of physics or biology to any such idea. So from de uh, the person who says, I'm a deist, I don't think all of this can be an accident, there must be some cosmic force, I say, I can't disprove it, though I think the cosmos functions without it, but you have all your work, sir, or ma'am, still ahead of you, before you can say that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person, let alone that he was the son of God, let alone that his mother was a virgin, let alone that he was resurrected. None of these things, by the way, would prove he was the son of God if they did happen, nor would they prove that his doctrines were not erroneous. A resurrected person who was the son of a virgin could still be talking nonsense. There's no logic that says he must be right. If I'm having an argument with you, sir, and you say, you lose, boy chick, I say, how come? because my mother never went to bed with, a, uh, with another man. Your logic is faulty. I think my, uh, my case could remain just as strong as ever it was. Uh, in default of that, I must say rather bizarre uh, intervention. Now. There's a comparable story I was told about, about the death of uh, I think it was a Roman Catholic priest, but it could be any Christian official, really, who gets to St. Peter's Gate and is told, well, you're well done, that good and faithful servant. Here's your place we've been preparing for you in paradise. And he says to St. Peter, but I see that there's terrible suffering and deprivation and misery among the souls in hell. Surely my place is with them, ministering to them. And he's told, you really don't get it, do you? Um, one of the reasons why... I like doing this. Some people say sometimes, don't I ever get tired of debating with the religious? No, absolutely I don't, because you never know what they're going to say next. <laughs> Sam and I don't mind being called predictable. It's very easy. We, we, we know what we think. We say straight out where we think we know, and where we think it's not possible to know, why we don't think there's a supernatural, and so on. But this evening already we've had your suggestion that God is only really a guru, a friend when you're in need. I mean, he wouldn't do anything like bugger around with Job to prove a point. And Which, if I now tell you, well, that must mean that that book is not the Word of God. You'd say, well, whoever believed that ever, that ever was the Word of God. Let me just tell you something. For hundreds and thousands of years, this kind of discussion would have been in most places impossible to have, or Sam and I would have been having it at the risk of our lives. Religion now comes to us in this smiley face, ingratiating way, <laughs> because it's had to give so much ground, and because we know so much more. But you've no right to forget the way it behaved when it was strong, and when it really did believe that it had God on its side. <laughs> You're Joseph Stalin. You've taken over Russia. You've been educated in a seminary in Georgia, by the way. Up till 1917, for hundreds of years, hundreds of millions of Russians have been told that the head of the state is a god. That the Tsar is above power, ordinary secular power, that he's the head of the Russian Orthodox Church as well as the you shouldn't be in the dictatorship business if you can't take advantage of a well, a deep well of credulity and servility like that. It's your golden opportunity. What does he do? Heresy trials. Heresy trials, witch hunts. Miraculous discoveries such as Lysenko's biology. The worship of the leader from whom all blessings flow. As I described North Korea, the most religious state I've ever seen. Um, mutatis mutandis, this would apply also to Mao's China with the same background of superstition and servility. Now, for there to be a fair test about this, you'd have to do the following. And no one I've ever debated with has even tried it. So you be the first. You find me a state or a society that threw off theocracy and threw off religion and said, we adopt the teachings of Lucretius and Democritus and Galileo and Spinoza and Darwin and Russell and Jefferson and Thomas Paine. 
And we make those what we teach our children. We make that scientific and rational humanism our teaching. And you find me the state that did that and fell into tyranny and slavery and famine and torture. And then we'll be on a level playing field. As it is, all you've done is show that the idea of worship and the idea of credulity and the idea of servility and slavery to religion is a bad idea in the first place. But none of the czars and none of the Chinese kings... None of the... Since I want to be peaceful about this, yes. can we all agree that whether there's an afterlife or not, the point of life is to live in such a way that you deserve one? <laughs> well, that would be true if there was no God. <laughs> <laughs> I did my best. Be I did my best. That, I no, which, which I've already postulated. There could yeah. be no God and an afterlife, or an afterlife and no God. If there is a dictator who distributes reward and punishment, then you can never be sure if you're doing a right action or an action born out of fear okay. or the hope of reward. So, no, it's, it, it's an incitement in a way to, to immorality, but any, and certainly to servility, which is not a moral position to be occupying. No. absolutely convinced that the main source of hatred in the world is religion and organized religion. Absolutely convinced of it. And I, I'm glad that you applaud because it's a very great problem for those who oppose this motion, isn't it? How are they going to ban religion? How are they going to stop the expression of religious loathing, hatred, and bigotry? And I speak as someone who's a fairly regular target of this and not just in rhetorical form. I have been the target of many death threats. I know in, within a f short distance of where I'm currently living in Washington, I can name two or three uh, people whose names you'd probably know who can't go anywhere now without a security detail because of the criticisms they've made of one monotheism in particular. And this is in the capital city of the United States. So I know what I'm talking about, and I also have to, have to notice that the sort of people who ring me up and say they know where my children go to school and they certainly know what my home number is and where I live and what they're going to do to them and to my wife and to me and who I have to take seriously because they have done it to people I know uh, are just the people who are going to seek the protection of the hate speech law if I say what I think about their religion, which I'm now going to do. <laughs> because I don't, have any, um, I don't have any what you might call ethnic bias. I've no grudge of that sort. I can rub along with pre pretty much anyone of any, as it were, origin or sexual orientation or language group, except people from Yorkshire, of course, um, <laughs> who are completely untakeable. Um, and I'm beginning to resent the confusion that's being imposed on us now, and there was some of it this evening, between uh, religious belief, uh, bl blasphemy, ethnicity, profanity, and what one might call multicultural etiquette. It's quite common now for people to use the expression, for example, anti-Islamic racism, as if an attack on a religion was an attack on an ethnic group. The word Islamophobia, in fact, is beginning to acquire the opprobrium of the, uh, that was once reserved for racial prejudice. This is a subtle and very nasty insinuation that needs to be met head on. Who said, what if Falwell says he hates fags? What if people act upon that? The Bible says you have to hate fags. If Falwell says he's saying it because the Bible says so, he's right. Yes, it might make people go out and use violence. What are you going to do about that? You're up against a group of people who will say, you don't you put your hands on our Bible or we'll call the hate speech police. Now, what are you going to do when you've dug that trap for yourself? Uh, somebody said that anti-Semitism and Kristallnacht in Germany was the result of 10 years of Jew baiting. 10 years? You must be joking. It's the result of 2,000 years of Christianity it, uh, based on one verse of one chapter of St. John's Gospel, which led to a pogrom after every Easter sermon every year for hundreds of years 
because it claims that the Jews demanded the blood of Christ be on the heads of themselves and all their children to the remotest generation. That's the warrant and license for and incitement to anti-Jewish programs. What are you going to do about that? Where's your piddling subsection now? Does it say St. John's Gospel must be censored? Do I who've read Freud and know what the future of an illusion really is and know that religious belief is ineradicable as long as we remain a stupid, poorly evolved mammalian species, think that some Canadian law is going to solve this problem? Please. No, our problem is this. Our prefrontal lobes are too small and our adrenaline glands are too big and our thumb finger opposition isn't all that it might be. And we're afraid of the dark and we're afraid to die and we believe in the truths of holy books that are so stupid and so fabricated that a child can, and all children do, but as you can tell by their questions, actually see through them. And I think it should be religion treated with ridicule and hatred and contempt. And I claim that right. I'm actually a bit amazed we haven't got to wish fulfillment yet. Could I say a word about sure. that? I mean, I mean, Freud in his Future of an Illusion says that the, the, the connection between our desires and our beliefs in the case of the afterlife is so obvious, it's mankind's oldest and most strong dread. Maybe we could duck the fate that appears to be in store for us. That it's unlike any, I mean, it's unlike any belief that Sam and I can offer you. Maybe all kinds of discrepancies between scientific views. Of, we, we cannot promise you uh, things of this kind, um, as religion always has to people. It doesn't make us morally superior, but it does mean, and we're not particularly happy with what we propose, which is overwhelmingly likely that annihilation and extinction await us. It's just that the overwhelming weight of evidence seems that way. Now, again, to quote Dinesh, he said to me once, well, I can see why people want heaven for themselves, and that that's wish-fulfilling, and eternal life, even though I think that's a horrible idea myself, but still. But why do they want hell? Why would, why would a wish-fulfiller... Um, invent the inferno. Well, I think that's pretty obvious. Um, it's for other people to go to. <laughs> uh, very old rhyme among English Calvinists was, um, we are the pure and chosen few and all the rest are damned. There's room enough in hell for you. We don't want heaven crowned. <laughs> in fact, in the work of many early church fathers, I'm so glad to find, by the way, that anything written in the first century by religious people doesn't count. <laughs> and I, I, I wish that more ministers of religion would make that concession. <laughs> you know, um, but Tertullian and many other, many other Christian fathers thought that one of the pleasures of heaven, because it's always been rather hard to describe them, you ever noticed that? Eating foie gras to the sound of trumpets was uh, the Reverend Sidney Smith's best shot. <laughs> we know what the Muslims think for men. Um, <laughs> apparently for women, do you know what they get? They get their husbands back. <laughs> Is that heaven? Nothing man-made about that, right? <laughs> um, but, but the church, at least the Christian church, I said, no, one of the pleasures of paradise is surveying and relishing the torments of the damned. Uh, when we talk about wish fulfillment, we're talking about the very unpleasant primate species to which we belong and the self-interested fantasies that it will continue to generate. I, you know, so what, one of which I, is, is really... Go ahead. Sorry. How am I doing for time? Eight minutes. Bloody good. Um, there's a, the, this question of the, the beginning of things um, is, of course, very important. Um, and if you think that it must have had a beginner as well as a beginning, uh, that it's not just a design or an apparent uh, design, but it must have had a designer, you are only asking for another question to be asked, which is, who created this creator? Who designed this designer? Who fixed up this prime mover? Who was the prime mover for that prime mover? The, the common word for this in logic and some philosophy uh, causes is uh, it's an infinite regression. It doesn't really get you uh, anywhere, but as I say, it wouldn't get you to religion, even if you could prove that there must have been a prime mover. It wouldn't get you to the worship of other human beings as if they were prophets or saviors or redeemers. It can't help you get there. You have to believe that as a matter of faith or not. You can't do it from 
from physics. There's furthermore, I think, an, an, an almost um, insuperable ontological problem involved here. Suppose it to be true. Suppose that I concede it. Suppose there must be such a designer or an individual, an intelligence, a, a, something like a person that does this. How could I know it? Which person is smarter, su sufficiently smarter, perhaps I should say, smart enough, smarter than me, smarter than anyone here, smarter, I dare say, even than Frank, to know this person and what's in his mind? I submit that it's not possible for another human being to tell you he knows this to be true any more than it's possible for me to tell you, which I don't try and do, because I'm not unreasonable in this way, that I know it isn't true. But don't you see that there's all the difference in the world between my saying I can't know it and Frank saying, well, I can't prove it, because he wants you to believe it's necessary so that you will then become Christian. And I say that that's a leap that you simply cannot make, and you certainly can't make on the basis of evidence. I think the religious would be much better to leave evidence alone where they don't excel and to concentrate on faith where at least they can claim some kind of monopoly. If you say that faith does nothing for you, as Christopher repeats over and over again, it's very hard to explain why it is that millions and millions of people all over the world and throughout history have felt that faith deepens their life, gives them meaning, increases their goodness, and why it is, for example, in America, that people of faith give more to charity, um, vote more in elections, volunteer more, help more. Do you know what the largest aid organization is, aid and development organization in the United States? It's not CARE. It's not Save the Children. It's a One World, which is a Christian organization out of Seattle, which not only gives millions and millions and millions of dollars across the world, but sends people all across the world to the most beleaguered, helpless places, and they do it because they believe they're called to do it by God. It's just not true that having faith makes no difference in this world. It makes a tremendous difference, and the vast majority of that difference, not all of it, but the vast majority of that difference is for goodness. Let me put a question then, if, if you'd be so good. The rabbi feels... It. The rabbi feels in a sandwich, and I don't mean for you to feel in a sandwich. No, so let me put this to you. Uh, oh, that's okay. Christopher, what about uh, the solace of faith? Uh, some of the most religious people I know ended up there. Oh, this when, is a softball. Well, I want a hard well, No, I mean, I, I know what he's going to say to this. Well, maybe, but you he's been hard minded, hard hearted, non meter of yes, solace. You're, worse, you're a misanthrope because you're not sympathetic <laughs> to people's need. For religion. I say in my book, available at fine bookstores everywhere, <laughs> that as, as long as I don't have to hear about it, I don't mind what people believe. If they say, well, thanks to Joseph Smith and his gold plates, I have real faith now, and I've got a family, and I have friends, and I have a real system, and so on, I say, fine, fine. Just don't come to my front door with it. <laughs> don't ask for a tax break for it. Don't ask my children to be taught it in the school. Did you sign up for my thinking you wouldn't hear it? about it? And I asked I ask ask the question in the book. People think they have a personal relationship with the creator, and they, they're the possessors of a wonderful secret. It must feel, I've never felt it, but it, I presume it feels great. Why doesn't it make them happy? They're not happy. They can't be happy until everyone else believes it too. They go out and proselytize very often. No. And, and here's, I can't let your, first, your last answer go. Very often in the guise of charity. You notice how often that religion, rather than answer the questions that I've put, like, how do you know there's a God? What evidence do you have for it? Which you say, well, lots of good people do good things because they're religious. Well, let's take the most recent pressing case. Uh, Richard Dawkins and I and a few others in the response to the Haiti earthquake set up a, an emergency charity for people of non-belief to give to because so many charitable organizations are, in fact, proselytizing groups. So we raised about two million in a weekend. On this question of your rabbinical authority, I'd also like to concede, because I would say that someone who says there's no afterlife has said they're not a Christian or a Muslim. And I have found it harder to make that sort of blanket remark about Judaism, even with Rambam's stipulation. It's not, it's not an optional thing. It's one of the things you, it's a mandatory belief. 
and even with your concession that when you were dire directly asked you expect to see your grandmother again and you did what very few Jews will do and say well she's only metaphorical <laughs> I was once not I was, only, once, just I was metaphorical. once asked by the Spertus Institute in Chicago which is the Jewish University to give a talk on the question do Jews have a gene for atheism <laughs> and I speculated that the majority of you seem to be yes I mean uh, um, Jew, Jews do not make the mistake of saying the Messiah has already come, the crass mistake of saying that. Rambam, him, Rambam himself says he will come, but he may tarry. No other religion does this. What's the name for a heretic in, Jew, in Hebrew? Epicurus. Epicurus. Epicurean. They teach people all the pitfalls of Greek philosophy and Hellenism, inviting them to discover the joys of sane. And ever since Spinoza, it seems to me that the Jewish people who probably ought to be doing this because it was their fault to invent monotheism in the first place, <laughs> have become the first to transcend it. It can't be coincidence, can it? Just like people say it can't be coincidence so many Jews win the Nobel Prize. I'm serious. Spinoza, Marx, Freud, Einstein, it, it goes on. And it does seem to be latent in the Jewish demand to ask questions. Yes, except so, well, no, I'm, this, very, I'm very happy. This, to, it's, it's, much, know, it's much more of a pleasure to debate. Maurice, Maurice Samuel, who is a Jewish writer and thinker, um, said that the reason that the Jews continue to exist is that they refused to quit this world until they figured out what it was about. <laughs> and, yes. and Leo Strauss says, very seriously, he said that the purpose of the Jews is to show there's no such thing as redemption. <laughs>
senior theologian, Alistair McGrath, at Georgetown last week. As it was over, I said to myself, they never come up with any new arguments. And I thought to myself, well, they wouldn't, would they? <laughs> These are old arguments. It's no disgrace that they're old. It's that we have better explanations now for where we're from, why we're here, who we are, where our cosmos comes from, where we are. Religion was the first and the worst, but at least it was first to try philosophy and biology and so on. Has the former majority leader Tom DeLay been lobbying you at all on the issue of religion? No, we've just agreed to be shoulder, and shoul shoulder to shoulder against the theocratic terrorists in Iraq. Amen. On that, we are faith-based scumbags <laughs> will not take over Mesopotamia. <laughs> Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> I love that.